Underwater aircraft carriers. What the heck? This uh, video was requested by Tony Morn over on Patreon. Tony says this is a good follow on to your question in the episode of The World at War, which is a 26 episode, one hour episode documentary series on World War II. The whole thing is over on Patreon if you want to go check that out. It's the one from uh, 1973 with, with Laurence Olivier uh, narrating. He says, why, why didn't Japan bomb America? I I remember asking that question. This video is about a plan they had to do just that, using an airplane carrying submarine. I think you will find this covers several of your areas of interest. Yeah, I was trying to picture like, what the heck is an underwater carrier? Like, how does that work? And then logic kicked in and I was like, well, it has to be in a submarine, right? So a plane like launches from a submarine. I have no idea how you even do that though. Like, how do you fit a plane? Like what size plane are we talking about? Are we talking about like a full size plane? Are we talking about like a little, like a drone type? Plane? You know, maybe maybe Japan had drones before drones were really a thing. I have heard about Japan bombing like the Aleutian Islands or something in Alaska, and I think they got like some uh, balloons or something over the Pacific Northwest, but by and large they didn't really, or in, and also like maybe they got into the San Francisco Bay or something like that, but they just, you know, their plans fell apart. They weren't able to actually pull off an attack on the um, American West Coast. And I did learn how, you know, Germany got uh, people into basically the New York Harbor. <laughs> so, so they were trying, you know, the Axis powers were trying from both sides to attack the United States. We were really lucky in that we did not sustain, you know, damage like Europe did. But this sounds like a really, really cool, uh, like, military invention that I've never heard of before. So this should be brand new and I think it'll be really interesting. In August of 1945, as the world celebrates the end of the Second World War, out in the Pacific, the Americans make a puzzling discovery. The U.S. Navy has intercepted a Japanese submarine, and it's unlike anything they've seen before. Its scale is baffling. But not only is it the world's largest submarine, it's an entirely new kind of weapon, a submarine that can launch torpedo dive bombers. The Americans have just stumbled across Japan's secret underwater aircraft carriers. And soon, they'll uncover a sinister plan that could have changed the course of the war. Holy cow. Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 is an event that galvanizes a nation, pulling a reluctant America into the Second World War. The unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday... A day after the devastating attack, the United States declares war on Japan, and the nation quickly mobilizes, firing up its enormous industrial might to crank out ships, tanks, and aircraft at a rate that'll soon bury Japan's military. For the Americans, Pearl Harbor was a senseless and cowardly provocation. But for the Japanese, the attack was something entirely different, a calculated gamble, and a long shot attempt at actually trying to avoid a full scale war with the United States. I always kind of like balk at people when they're, when they say that something is like an attack or something is cowardly just because the enemy didn't want to like go face to face like full combat with you. I mean, as much as, you know, I, I don't want to like praise enemy tactics or anything. I mean, I just look at it and it's, it's smart. Like if you can get a leg up on an adversary, particularly one that's more powerful than you, then, you know, how is that cowardly? That's actually out outfoxing your enemy. <laughs> That's how I look at it. And I just, I don't understand this, this notion that you have to, uh, like, I don't know, man up and, and do the honorable thing and fight, you know, like face to face on, you know, being fair about it. Like it's war, you know? Because as the empire of Japan continued its ruthless conquest in Asia, the Japanese were convinced that it was only a matter of time before the U.S. intervened. And the architect behind the Pearl Harbor attack, Japanese Admiral Yamamoto, 
was aiming to knock out much of the U.S. Pacific fleet in one decisive blow, as a way to keep the United States out of the Pacific for at least another six months, and perhaps even forcing the Americans into negotiating a truce. But Imperial Japan grossly underestimated America's resolve, and in the aftermath, Yamamoto knew America's military might would soon overwhelm Japan's. Now faced with a war he cannot win, Yamamoto devises another strategy. To make America reconsider a drawn-out war in the Pacific, he'll bring the war directly to America's cities. But with the United States now on guard for Japanese forces, Yamamoto will need a truly stealthy weapon to reach the United States. A weapon the Americans would never suspect. The concept of launching aircraft from a submarine originated before the Second World War. But these earlier attempts were experimental trials, usually involving a single lightweight reconnaissance plane. What Yamamoto had in mind was far more ambitious, a fleet of submarines that could carry multiple attack aircraft and strike fear into the enemy by launching surprise attack. So they just launch off the front of the submarine like that? Isn't that less, um, that's shorter, isn't that a shorter runway than what a carrier would have? Unless, I don't know how big these things are, they, I don't, they didn't look like they were on the scale of an aircraft carrier. But, I mean, and I also know that aircraft carriers today, at least the US ones, use the catapult system, so they probably have something like that on here as well, just to get the plane off. But, yeah, I, I had it in my, my head a picture of the plane, like, coming out of a hole, <laughs> like, the side of the... But, but that's dumb because like it can't take off doing that. So I, I don't know what I was thinking. Acts on cities only to submerge and disappear again. In March of 1942, Japanese engineers were handed the enormous task of designing Yamamoto's secret weapon. To start, Yamamoto's aircraft carrying subs would need to be capable of launching full-size torpedo dive bombers and engineers would have to design a catapult launch system and a mechanism to recover the aircraft and bring them back on board. Holy but making cow, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I didn't even think about like having to land back on that thing. What? How would you even do that? That looks super sketchy. Bombers fit inside a submarine would be an even bigger challenge. With a typical World War II era dive bomber having a wingspan of about 12 meters, engineers would also need to design an entirely new dive bomber, one that could be folded up to fit inside the sub's hangar. The submarines would also need to be able to reach any part of America's coastline, thousands of kilometers away, and then return all the way back to Japan without refueling or resupplying. An event carrying nearly two million liters of diesel fuel and enough supplies to support a crew out at sea for months. Japan so what are they, they're just doing a round trip? So they're gonna, wait, what was that route again? So they're, oh, they're going the long way to the US. So that's, they're trying to get to the East Coast, I guess. So they're gonna, they had plans to do the East Coast and the West Coast. Well, in the, in the previous, um, cliff where they were showing the arrows approaching the U.S. from both sides. I assumed that the ones coming into the East Coast were from Germany because Germany did that, you know? Um, and I just thought that Japan was focusing on the West Coast, so they were like in collaboration, you know, coming in. But I guess that meant that that was Japanese subs on both sides of the U.S. I would not want to be in the crew that had to go all the way around the globe like that. That would be so miserable i guess and they probably use diesel fuel too at this point like they didn't have nuclear subs right so i mean how do you keep fueled and stuff thousands of kilometers away and then return all the way back to japan without refueling or resupplying an event carrying nearly two million liters of diesel fuel uh -huh. and enough supplies to support a crew out at sea for months Guess you don't. Japan's secret underwater aircraft carriers would be designated as the I-400, and they'd be enormous, nearly twice the length of a typical German U-boat, to support the weight of the hangar and to- That means nothing to me. I don't know how big a U-boat is. 
nearly twice the length of a typical German U-boat. To support the weight of the hangar and to keep the sub stable during carrier operations, engineers innovated a double hull design, essentially two hulls stuck together. It gave the mammoth I-400 nearly three times the displacement of even the largest American submarine. And the I-400 was still a formidable submarine in the conventional sense, armed with eight forward-mounted torpedo tubes and a massive deck gun. And to fend off enemy aircraft, three triple-mounted anti-aircraft guns and a fourth single-mounted gun on the sail. Okay, how do you protect the guns from water when it goes underwater? Do the guns um, go inside when you're underwater? I would assume so. Or are they waterproof somehow? Because I would think that going underwater with them would basically ruin them. I don't know. I've, I don't know if I've ever seen a subway or subway, <laughs> a submarine with um, with guns on it before. Seems like all the ones that I see at the U.S. are just like smooth along the top. I don't recall ever seeing a gun. Maybe, maybe I did and I just wasn't paying attention. But of course, the I-400's primary weapons were its three torpedo dive bombers. She can only fit three in there though. Like that's not a lot. The element of surprise was an underwater aircraft carrier's greatest advantage. And as the I-400 silently approached its target, its crew would already begin preparing the aircraft. So the three aircraft made me think about something. It's not a lot, so you're... It's a long way to go just to take to, to spit, send three planes to bomb something. And I feel like back then, especially when planes weren't as accurate and stuff, um, that's a big... That is a big gamble. That is a huge gamble. At this point in history with warfare, did the concept of having like missiles shooting out of submarines like we have today uh, not exist? Like, did they just have like shells that they could shoot um, just like a short distance, maybe? I don't know like when the technology was developed for them to be able to shoot missiles that could, you know, go a, th a thousand miles or, or what, hundreds of miles, I don't know, whatever. Because that certainly would be way better than something like this. But I guess back then, without like GPS and stuff, you wouldn't... I, I don't know how they determined where the missiles would go. And I think about that like with the nuclear missiles and stuff too. Like, How did they did, um, guide the missiles to a target back then? Before computers, GPS, and all of that stuff. Or did they, they just shoot it and hope that it landed somewhere close to where they wanted? Mechanics would start by running heated oil through the aircraft's engines, so they would be warmed up and ready to launch. The mammoth submarine would surface a few hundred kilometers from its target, and the race would be on to get three bombers airborne. Each aircraft would be rolled out from the hangar onto the deck. Crews would then start the engine, unfold the wings and tail, lock floats into place, and load armament. One by one, the three aircraft would be launched using a compressed air catapult. The whole process would take 30 minutes, after which the I-400 would dive back to safety and silently wait for the bombers to return from their mission. The torpedo dive bombers were cutting edge. They were designed specifically for the I-400 and could carry the largest bomb or torpedo in Japan's naval arsenal. You have Equipped one bomb? with a pair of floats, the aircraft would land alongside the submarine to be hoisted back aboard using a collapsible hydraulic crane. Wait, the so it lands on to the back? Equipped with a pair of floats, the aircraft would land alongside the submarine Ooh. to be hoisted back aboard using a collapsible hydraulic crane. Oh. The aircraft could also be launched without floats for greater range and performance, but forcing the pilots to ditch into the ocean after their mission. The I-400 was a brilliant design, merging the stealth of a submarine with the offensive strike capability of an aircraft carrier. But Japan's new superweapon would make no difference in the war. Okay, so on this um, animation, the guns and stuff are just out in the water. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that.
On August 15, 1945, after nearly four years of brutal conflict, and with American forces closing in and the bombing of Japanese cities, Japan finally surrendered. The Americans first intercepted an I-400 off the coast of Japan two weeks after the surrender. And at first, they weren't exactly sure what it was. The Japanese crews had thrown all of the attack aircraft overboard. And at first, the Americans believed that the I-400 was designed to carry cargo. But they'd soon unravel the submarine's true purpose, and why Japan never used them in the war. To start, many in Japan's navy considered Yamamoto's underwater aircraft carriers to be a farce, and the slow process of launching aircraft in the middle of a combat zone too dangerous for submarine crews. But resistance to the concept would soon be the least of Yamamoto's concerns, because it took nearly a year to design such an unconventional weapon. Construction of the first I-400s only began at the start of 1943. By then, the Japanese were already losing the war. After a crushing defeat in June of 1942, the Americans were pushing the Japanese back across the Pacific. And Japan was running critically short on fuel and raw materials, delaying I-400 construction even further. And Yamamoto himself would never live to see any of his submarines completed. In 1943, while on an inspection tour through the South Pacific, Yamamoto's plane was downed by American forces. What started as a plan to build a fleet of 18 underwater aircraft carriers was eventually whittled down to just five, and only three were ever completed. The first entering service in 1945, so late in the war that Japan's military had already all but collapsed. Launching sneak attacks on American cities with a handful of dive bombers would have been pointless. Even a more strategic mission to bomb the Panama Canal was abandoned after Japanese command felt that it too would have made little difference so late in the war. The only mission the I-400 would ever set out on was a last-ditch effort to bomb American forces as they amassed off a tiny Pacific atoll. But as the first I-400s traveled to their targets, Japan surrendered, finally ending the Second World War. Wow. Aircraft carrier submarines had always been a gamble, a way to change odds so stacked against Japan that only through sheer ingenuity could the tables be turned. And had the sub arrived at the start of the war, it might have made a difference. But Japan's secret weapon wasn't without compromise. The process of launching three aircraft was supposed to take 30 minutes, but rare- Hang on, let me- So the planes had to fit inside there? That is tiny. <laughs> How are planes that small? Holy cow. Even with the wings folded in. I would think that the body of the plane would be too big to fit in. I mean, obviously it wasn't, but it just doesn't look like it would fit in there. The difference. But Japan's secret weapon wasn't without compromise. The process of launching three aircraft was supposed to take 30 minutes, but rarely could it be accomplished in less than 45. A dangerous amount of time for such a large submarine to be surfaced. And the I-400's bombers, while sophisticated in their design, were rushed into service and built from lower grade materials due to shortages. They were notoriously unreliable. Rarely could all three get airborne without some mechanical problem. And the enormous I-400's depth time, critical for getting out of danger, was nearly double that of American submarines. Even submerged, it was still vulnerable. With a hull that was riveted, not welded, it likely would have stood up poorly against depth charges. Still, the Americans considered the I-400 to be a dangerous weapon, especially in the wrong hands. And in 1946, with the Soviets demanding to inspect the subs for themselves, the Americans scuttled the I-400s off the coast of Hawaii and Japan, keeping their exact wreckage locations secret, and closing the chapter on an ambitious new kind of weapon that in a different set of circumstances might have changed the course of the war.
Well, admittedly, it is a very cool design, a very cool idea. Um, it just seems really inefficient to me though, because you only have three planes and it looked like each plane only had one bomb. What are the odds of that bomb actually hitting the target uh, back in those days, you know? Because they used to have to carpet bomb to get anywhere close to the target that they wanted and sometimes they didn't even do that. I don't know, it just seems like a lot of work for very little payoff, you know? Plus the planes would have had, you know, a chance of getting shot down or something too. I don't know, it just, it's a really interesting idea, just not super practical, I think, in, in real combat situations. And also the submarine having to stay on the surface, taking 45 minutes to launch three planes. I mean, all they had to do was, was roll the plane out of the hangar, hook it up to the catapult, bring the wings out and go, you know? Like, how does that take 45 minutes for three planes? It must have been a pretty complicated system that they had if, you know, for it to take that long, so. It's a pretty ingenious concept, you know, before they had missiles that they could shoot off of submarines, this was the next best thing, I guess. Were there any other um, countries that were developing something like this? Because he said that, you know, Japan wasn't the first one. I don't know if he said um, who it was that was considering submarines like this. Obviously the Americans weren't <laughs> because they had no idea what it was. Okay, Tony, well, I appreciate it. That was a really interesting video. I learned about a new piece of uh, equipment that I didn't even know existed. So that was, that was pretty cool. If you thought it was cool, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button. It helps this video reach more people and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. I have links to social media, contact, info and my Patreon down in the description and the pinned comment. I have a lot of videos over on Patreon that I don't put up here on YouTube, so you might want to go check that out and see what's up over there. Anyway, uh, Roger didn't even say hey, but uh, he'll say goodbye now. And I'll say goodbye too. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.